ikibutuma mpabwa kato kubera kubana naga ko batera sida mesh cyane we n'umucyo rwanda ntutwemera ntabwo nabaturage nawe byeyi wacu ntabyemera naje nkusi nabivuga mu ruko cyane cyane ntabwo byemera Devens, I wonder what the queer go thing, creepy Misha, but for any guess. HIV is one of the world's most serious health and development challenges and 34 million people are still living with the virus, with Sub-Saharan Africa worst hit. Despite these challenges, global efforts, particularly in the last decade, have contributed to significant progress towards reducing and treating the epidemic and there are signs that it may be changing course. Among the successes are a reduction of 20% of people newly affected since 2001, an increase of 20% in just one year from 2010 to 2011 of people having access to antiretroviral therapy, a reduction of 24% of children newly infected with HIV in just two years from 2009 to 2011, a decline of 24% of HIV-related death since the peak in 205. But although encouraging, those global figures make no mention of the marginalized communities that most intervention programs do not reach out to successfully. Yet those people are often more at risk of spreading and being infected with a virus. The hard to reach communities are populations excluded from HIV and AIDS prevention and treatment services as a result of their livelihood styles and geographical location, such as pastoralists and fisher folks. Their ethnicity, such as indigenous populations, their sexual orientation, their commercial sex activity, or their economic and gender status. In addition to being the poor relation to the HIV and AIDS interventions, those marginalized groups have to face serious stigma and discrimination that acts as a catalyst in fueling the disease. This film aims to give more light on the lives of those excluded populations, stating concrete issues and their consequences, calling upon progress that needs to be made to choose inclusion rather than exclusion, as a joint effort between those communities, governments, medical staff and the whole society, and as a prerequisite to help curb the spread of HIV and in the end, eradicate the epidemic. All hard to reach communities have to face issues of social exclusion stigma and discrimination, lack of access to prevention, treatment and care, and most of the time, high levels of poverty. The pastoralist communities are engaged in livelihoods options that alienate them from existing traditional health services. The pastoralist transhuman lifestyle causes limited awareness of the epidemic, which results in denial, stigma and discrimination against pastoralists living with HIV, and presents serious challenges in effective responses to those communities. Among the Maasai pastoralists, for example, the exodus of the youth in search of livelihoods alternatives in neighboring towns has created changes in their lifestyle, resulting from cross marriages and unprotected sexual intercourse, contributing to the spread of HIV in pastoralist communities. Awareness raising is also still challenged by the deeply revered yet harmful cultural practices like forceful courtship 
and wife inheritance. While there are a number of people unable to access health services, groups like commercial sex workers and sexual minorities are particularly discriminated given that their sexual behaviour and practices are perceived as morally and culturally unacceptable. C'est contre la nature. Nous sommes grandis comme ça. Nous avons été éduqués comme ça que c'est contre la nature. Que c'est l'homme et la femme qui doivent coucher ensemble. Pas l'homme et l'homme, pas la, la, la femme et la femme. Non. On sait déjà qu'il y a une, le, le gouvernement est contre vous. On ne va pas, une fois qu'on tombe malade ou si on veut faire un test de dépistage, ça ne sera pas facile pour le, le, le LGBT, le, le lesbien, le gay ou le transsexuel d'approcher la structure de lutte contre le sida, par exemple, et de dire je suis homosexuel, j'ai telle maladie ou je veux me faire dépister. D'autant plus que tu ne sais pas comment tu vas être accueilli. Parce que tu as peur, on dit, si, si je vais dans cette structure et qu'on me dise, et que je dise je suis homosexuel, je veux me faire soigner telle ou telle maladie, on a peur que, par exemple, le prestataire de santé appelle la police et dise « nous avons un homosexuel ici ». Donc, euh, il y a ces, euh, cette discrimination qui fait que le, les minorités sexuelles s'autodiscriminent eux aussi. Studies indicate that commercial sex workers and sexual minorities engage in sexual practices which present high risk factors to themselves as well as to their partners. For instance, a significant portion of men who engage in sexual relations with men, as well interacting with female sexual partners, creates a breach of infection. Commercial sex workers often have multiple sexual partners and an inconsistent use of condoms. Although HIV is considered a minor health risk for women having sex with women in the developed world, in Africa most of them are married and have children. This exposes them to the same risk of contracting the virus as heterosexual women. Commercial sex workers as well as sexual minorities, are often stigmatized and discriminated when it comes to access to health care and they are subjected to triple stigma. Self-stigma, HIV-related stigma, and sexual orientation or practice-related stigma. Yo <laughs> igihugu abantu bagashaka kumfata nk'ukumengo cyangwa se leta igashaka kumfata nk'ukumengo sindi umuntu The controversy around the rights of commercial sex workers and sexual minorities stems from cultural, religious, legal and ethical positions held by governments. Ingaka ko zera ari nyinshi kuko ari gihe utabivuga ukajya kubikora so atwarwaruka kora bitwazo tabibabwiye kandi ari ku umeze kibazo nuko batumba ku muntu ariko abyumva ariko yavutse kibazo nuko batabyumva bavuga ngo mu cyonyarwanda ntibyemera hari ikibazo kirekire cyane cyo twe ni myumvire y'abaturage Indigenous people and ethnic minorities globally face some of the most serious issues of ill health In particular indigenous populations face a higher vulnerability to HIV due to a range of factors, including stigmatization, structural racism, and discrimination and individual community disempowerment. Hanyuma ndhuta ibitaro ingwara ngwaye bakanyita ucane bakaza kundunde onyene bakantu haramwitaro dose ibikene mbutaro byose bakafasha Equally communities in remote areas experience marginalization by virtue of their geographical location with limited access to healthcare services Coupled with extreme poverty, the spread of HIV and AIDS becomes rampant 
and almost no intervention programs include them. In fishing communities, the HIV prevalence rate is believed to range from 10 to 40 percent. This is far higher than the national averages. For instance, in East Africa, where the national average ranges from 6 to 7 percent. Studies have shown that numerous factors contribute to the vulnerability of fishing communities to HIV and AIDS, including living in remote locations, mobility of fishes, daily cash income, high alcohol consumption, cultural norms affected by living away from home, the lower status of women in many cultures, higher ratio of men to women at fish landing beaches, and attitudes to risk. Bakabalaba gore bi fataneza, ba mizeneza, ningo ba lela mahera ba kuye mukiaga, ba yaros, ba tekrezwa kuye fatamwe ibi, ba chata tekrezwa kuya honga ba ba pish, kugiranga ba pish na bo, kubera na bo ba ba fite uzima kwa uba buri ku itwe bwa ba rovi, kuko na handi ba ziku, na na handi ba ziga ubura ronu ba muko, ba chata tekrezwa lelo kutwe ger. Fishing communities have been sorely neglected in the provision of a wide range of services and they have not been recognized as a group vulnerable to HIV and AIDS, despite much evidence that the prevalence rates are higher within fisheries than many other groups and they have not received anywhere near adequate levels of assistance. children head of household and women survivors of sexual violence are also among the most marginalized groups and very little is done to invest in targeted interventions responding to their particular needs. For instance, and often less highlighted, women fleeing situations of conflict face violence that is also part of their necessary strategies for negotiating safe passage to refugee camps. According to the United Nations, less than 10% of children orphaned and made vulnerable by AIDS receive some kind of public support. Child-headed families have not only been deprived of their childhood, but they are often excluded from HIV intervention programs because of their age. <laughs> A successful example of HIV intervention among hard to reach communities was implemented in the East African region and specifically tackle the issues mentioned above. Three main areas of intervention were targeted, improving social inclusion, generating sustainable livelihood, 
in advocating for the right to health of marginalized groups. The program engaged the hard to reach communities with educational training on stigma and discrimination. This resulted to reduce stigma and discrimination, which led to improved self-esteem among marginalized groups and minorities. It also increased access to HIV and AIDS prevention, treatment and care through linking with health facilities. Women and girls in particular were engaged in several income generating activities, including growing of mushrooms, pineapples, mace, and vegetable and goat rearing. The women groups were also engaged in nutrition education for these groups, which contributed to improving harvest, quantity of food available in their households, and reducing food insecurity, increasing their revenues, improving food nutritional value in households as women have acquired knowledge on how to supplement the family meals, and in the end increasing access to credit facilities through the development of a saving culture. Behavioural change was a key focus of this program to ensure lasting change towards a stigma-free society and a socio-economic inclusion of those marginalised and minority groups. Sensitisation trainings targeted all hard to reach community groups, but also healthcare practitioners and local governmental authorities. For instance, sex workers were taught the importance of having protected sex in an attempt to prevent the spread of HIV and AIDS and other STIs. Behavioural change was initiated among the pastoralist community through peer education conducted by pastoralists themselves to take over the sensitization and education in their own communities. This was done through traditional cultural songs and drama where the youth were supported to develop new skills and attitudes for changing their traditional sexual behavior. The project also worked on promoting and providing healthcare facilities that would act as a contact source to many in remote areas, providing free testing and counseling to people affected by HIV and AIDS. Lastly, through training and advocacy, as well as the creation of linkages between the hard to reach communities and the service providers, these populations were given an opportunity to express their views on what they need and what is best for them. One of the program next steps is now to create space for those communities to be heard at a national and regional level, in spite of societal and sometimes political resistance. Although efforts to reach the marginalized communities may involve additional time and financial input, it is also important to take note of the cost of inaction. By excluding the hard to reach communities from the HIV and AIDS response, countries are faced with the likelihood of a reversal of the remarkable progress in the reduction of HIV. While they are excluded, marginalized communities are not closed and therefore can serve as hotspots of the epidemic. Besides that, these communities have a right to access health services and actors should ensure that they are provided without discrimination. Targeted the hard to reach communities means facilitating them to participate in designing the interventions intended to address their needs. 
they themselves have a good understanding of the social, cultural, economic and behavioural drivers of the epidemic, making them better placed to respond to their risks. As emphasised by the World Health Organisation, a country's difficult financial situation does not absolve it from having to take action to realise the right to health for its citizens. All stakeholders within the nation, including the people living with HIV, the communities in which they live, governments, the private sector and civil society organisations should collectively and innovatively respond to the needs of the hard to reach communities as per the national and international commitments to achieve zero HIV infection, zero discrimination and zero AIDS related death.